Welcome to RICO 12. I'm Justin. I am a recovering addict, and this is the podcast RICO 12. And I'm really excited about this episode here. Um, as mentioned in previous in the previous few episodes, back in 2019, I was hosting a different podcast called Journey Through Life. It was a long-form interview-style podcast. It was not recovery-based, although I was actively working my recovery during that time. And during that time, I felt compelled by my higher power to do a series in the Journey Through Life podcast called Journey in Recovery. In this series, I um, interviewed 16 people over a three-month period of time on each of the 12 steps of recovery. And it was during this three-month period that my own recovery walk was radically transformed and changed. And my vision of what the steps can do for anyone, anywhere, from any background was really opened up to me. Anyways, this episode is on step three, and this is Bill M., Bill M. is an alcoholic, and he has over 30 years recovery, over 30 years sobriety in AA. But in this story, he talks about how after 15 years, he was, quote, out of my mind insane. And he was a dry drunk, and he came to believe he had a step three experience after basically a (laughs) near-death, near-self-imposed death experience that brought him to the place where he is today. And what an amazing story it is. I look forward to having you hear this and gain from it. Just a reminder, an invitation, if you find meaning and value in RICO 12, please rate it and review it in the podcast platform of your choice. Come join one of our communities, whether it be WhatsApp, Facebook, or wherever it may be. All of that information is in the show notes of the podcast. And here we go. Let's hear Bill M. So I'm sitting here with Bill, and I'm really excited to have this conversation with you, Bill. And to get to know you, I mean, you and I are pretty much strangers. We've only spoken for a few few minutes before this. So tell me a little bit about yourself, how you would introduce yourself in a 12-step meeting. Oh, I start off by saying my name's Bill, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Bill. I'm on the East Coast. You're on the West Coast. <laughs> Correct. So are you in Massachusetts? Is that where you're at? Yeah, I'm uh, north of Boston. I'm closer to Nashua, New Hampshire than I am to Boston, you know, further up uh-huh. towards the uh, New Hampshire border. And I love the way you talk, Bill. I mean, this is, it's just so fun to listen to. Well, I was born and spent the first nine years of my life in Boston. So before <laughs> we moved north of the city. So I've been told I have a strong Boston accent. Yeah, you do, which is great. I love hearing it. So, all right, Bill. So tell me a little bit about your first initial introduction to introductions to alcohol and what kind of led you into um, saying that you're an alcoholic? Well, I first drank. I'm not going to talk about every sip I ever had. No. The first time I drank on purpose to get drunk, I was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, I had hung around with a bunch of guys that all drank by this time. They had all had much more experience drinking regularly than I had. I stayed away from it, and um, it was through a broken relationship that I picked up and started drinking for the purpose of getting out of whatever emotional pain that I was in at the moment was 18. Mm. So, So you used it at that point to get out of the emotional pain, to numb those feelings of rejection or whatever they may have been did you start drinking like occasionally or or often at that point or what was your experience from there I wasn't an heavy drinker at that point by any means that took I was 18 I was probably 23 before I got to the point where the first red flag went up and I'm like geez I'm I'm, I think I'm drinking a little too much remember Mm. I was uh being from Boston up was watching a Bruins game and um, I went to the refrigerator to get a beer and I there was four beers in the refrigerator and it just hit me that I wanted more than those four beers and that was the first time that that, that ever happened to me and you know I, you just kind of rationalize it away justify it away you know of course I ran out and got a six pack you know and came back that was my first time it caught my interest Hmm. So you're about 23. About when was this? Well, I'm 71, so I 
So nearly 50 years ago, huh? Yeah. Yeah. You first started recognizing, hmm, there's something to this drinking that may be leading me where, you know, I may or may not want to go when you were about 23. Tell me about the path to where you started uh, saying, all right, now I need to really seek some help. I was probably uh, 26, 27 years old when I realized that I was just simply drinking on a regular basis. You know, I had tried quitting um, never successfully, be rarely if ever, if I could make it more than a day. And I'm not at this point, you know, slobbering all over myself and staggering around in life. And, and I'm a maintenance drinker, but I'm an everyday maintenance drinker. It, it's habitual. Mm. You know, I started off with uh, drinking alcohol and, um, you know, a few years into that, I got into pot. Quickly after that, got into speed. Quickly after that, got into crystal meth. Quickly after that, got into cocaine. Went blind in one eye. And I mean blind, not not like partially blind, blind. Huh. And it wasn't until, it wasn't, I, I wasn't trying to be dishonest. I just couldn't connect the dots. Hmm. And finally, I said something to a doctor, and the, this doctor he said, um, Bill, that's exactly w- what's going on is you've, every time you snort, that you constrict the optic nerve. You know, it would come back. It would go out for quite some time, and then it would come back. And she said, you know, one more snort, and it may never come back. So that's what snapped me out of snorting crystal and, um, and cocaine at that point. But... They were accessories, really. You know, the alcohol mm. was always there. Yeah, I would drink and smoke pot, drink and take speed, drink and take crystal, drink and, you know, the crystal made me drink more, which is really what I liked, mm-hmm. you know. And so those were accessories. I mean, I was abusing them. And um, coming off of them was not pretty. Mm-hmm. But, you know, how I weaned myself off of um, 10 years of um, doing drugs like that was I increased the alcohol intake. That's the only oh, way I okay. can play. Hmm. And so it's been 10 years since I'm assuming. So probably about what, uh, 33, 34, 35 years old in there where you're starting to wean yourself off of. of yeah. I the... was probably about my thirties. Uh, let me think my, this, I'm in my second marriage by now The the alcohol and drugs killed the first one. Hmm. The second one was really ruined by um, untreated alcoholism, which we'll get into in a bit. My son was just born. He was born in 1980, my first boy. And um, he was small. He couldn't have been much more than one mm. when I finally got myself off the, the cocaine, which was the end. It was the last time, you know, and was just out of drinking, much heavier. Um, you know, not waiting till six o'clock at night and uh, five or six after work, you know, four or five or six after work and start hitting it hard. I'm doing it now, you know, noontime, you know, by the time my third son was born, I'm, I'm drinking in the morning. Mm. So you said that you tried to quit over and over and just never succeeded. What, what efforts did you make before? What types of things did you try to do that weren't successful to quit drinking and, and doing drugs? Well, the, the, doing the drugs was was easy because I was faced with a, you know, life-changing situation that I was going to be blind in that one eye. And uh, mm-hmm. it was, you know, relatively easy. Coming off the alcohol was not. I, and, and I didn't seek any outside help per se. I was just trying to, I was trying to manage it myself, right? Step one, you know, it was powerless mm-hmm. over alcohol. My life had become unmanageable. I'm trying to manage this. I'm trying to pace myself. I'm trying to um, not start until uh, five o'clock at night. I'm trying to just put a six pack in the refrigerator. You know, I'm married at the time. I, you know, I've, I've got a great marriage. I've got a, a, a couple kids. I'm holding a steady job. I'm just really trying to manage the alcohol intake, you know. Mm. Um, I didn't seek any outside help, really. Okay. Um, I would get in just before I quit drinking. June 9th, 1987 is my sobriety date. Awesome. Uh, just prior to that, I got into uh, marriage counseling, you know, if you will. And, uh, 
and I was still drinking. I was right at the end of my drink. And when I got into the marriage counseling and, you know, try to quit that to save the marriage. And it, it, it worked for a while. I uh, got into AA. I actually, my, um, my ex-wife is the one that got me into AA. She, uh, I, when I finally quit drinking, I stayed at home and I tried to detox myself and mm. I was probably two weeks sober by the time I went to my first AA meeting and she called AA and, um, had them come get me. You know, I was just out of my mind mm. and she saved my life, you know, quite frankly, you know? Yeah. So what did your rock bottom look like? Do you mind sharing that? Well, my rock bottom in, um, in, from drinking, was I fell down a flight of stairs and um, I had been really for the last year prior to that, I knew I was in trouble. I knew I was an alcoholic at this point. I was trying to quit, you know, couldn't get past 10 o'clock in the morning. And I just fell down a flight of stairs and really busted my knee up, my shoulder up. I really screwed myself up bad. Mm. And, um, I would like to say that was my last drink, but it was, I would only drink a little bit after that. I had to have an operation, you know, to fix my knee. And um, it was, wasn't until a month later, right prior to the operation that I quit only to get through the operation. So was your rock bottom after you had started attending an Alcoholics Anonymous then? Or... Oh, without a doubt, 15 yeah. years into it. Oh, wow. 15 years, I was two weeks shy of my anniversary, my 15th year anniversary when I had a nervous breakdown. Mm. I'll, I'm going to be very upfront with you. Just not yeah. drinking, going to meetings almost killed me. Mm. I do not adhere to that. That's all right if you're a week sober or a month sober. You're 10, we you're 10 years sober and you're saying there's something wrong with me. I don't feel right, you know, and uh, in the Northeast, there wasn't a lot of there was not there was a lot of lip service given to the steps, but mm. there wasn't a lot of actual step work. There is now, See, thank God, it's changed. Yeah. Uh, but 1987, by now it's 1997. You know, some guy just pointing at you, saying your your problem is you have no gratitude and you got to have more gratitude, and you're saying no, there's something wrong with me. There's something seriously wrong with me. So, so at that point you'd been in the program for, you know, 10, 15 years, but it doesn't sound like you had worked with a sponsor who had also really worked the steps. You weren't really working the steps. It was basically, you're going to meetings, you have your book with you at the meeting, you go home, you put it on the shelf until the next meeting and not really do much with it. Is that, am I interpreting that correctly? Yeah. Yeah. I, my first sponsor, you know, it took me through a, a very um, watered down method of doing the steps. You know, it was the first time. It just basically just write a few paragraphs about your life. Second time he had me do, it uh, was a Hazleton. It was a, that kind of a layout. They have a menu. It's like they give you the positives of your life. I, I'm a loving person. Now, across from that, you're supposed to write down the op something that, that a character defect, right? They give mm -hmm. you a, right. Character, so I didn't know what to write. <laughs> I couldn't come up with one thing good. You know? Oh wow! So I made it all up, you know. Oh, uh -huh. so, you know, just to um say I I did a that form of step work, you know, and um and I really thought I had I had done the steps, and I, we never ever did the steps out of the big book. We went to a walls and all huh. these other methods, and um but never. It wasn't until I got. I had the nervous breakdown that I was introduced to the steps out of the big book. Hmm. So tell me about that introduction to that and how those steps looked just real brief overview. And then we're going to dig into step three after that. Yeah. I'm, um, you know, probably 14 years sober and, um, I knew I was in trouble. I was having in horrible anxiety attacks. Uh, I'd wake up in the middle of the night. I was like somebody had hit me in the stomach and knocked the wind out of me. I couldn't breathe. You know, I'd been to the hospital. Uh, I thought I was having a heart attack. I, I've had EKGs and they just, no, you're just having anxiety. Um, 
but I didn't know what to do, you know, and I finally had a nervous breakdown. I was, I was, my second marriage is gone. I didn't want my kids to see me in the condition I was in. And I, I somehow drove myself um, up to New Hampshire and into the woods into a, a cabin in the woods. And I just basically crawled out there to die. You know, I didn't mm. want to come back out. Um, and um, I spent three days there just laying on the floor, roll, rolled up in a ball. And I cried myself to sleep. And then when I would wake up, I couldn't believe I was alive. And I would do that. And I'm, you know what? Let me tell you what. A, for people who don't know what a nervous breakdown is, if you could see a mirror that's intact but smashed, you can you can see everything, but nothing's connected. Mm. Some of the pieces are bigger than others. Some pieces you can deal with better than others, but you can't connect anything. It's just a horrible, horrible thing to go through. Mm. And um. And what pushed me over the edge was the anxiety. I couldn't take the anxiety. Anxiety is fear. It's a form of fear. It's un just right. an unnamed fear. Anyway, um, there was a payphone um, not far. It was right on the road. And um, I went out there and I made a phone call after three days. And um, I called a guy up that I, <laughs> geez, I had met about a month earlier. Mm -hmm. And I had known him years earlier in AA. And I saw that this guy was different than mm -hmm. he was the first three years I was in AA. And um, I looked at him. I said, hey, how you doing? He looked at me. He said, good. He looked mm -hmm. at me and asked me how I was doing. I told him a lie. I told him I was doing great. And he could see right through me. And he's the guy I called up at. He, you know, I'm crying my eyes out. He said, what's the matter? I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know. There's something the matter. He said, stay right there. He was two hours away. He said, I'm going to come get you. He came, got me and he took me to my first big book step meeting. Mm. It wasn't pretty. I'd like to tell you that it was a wonderful experience. I remember it vividly. I don't. What I remember vividly is the people there were pretty horrified that I was there hmm. and they were trying to tell him that they needed to get me to a hospital. And I remember him saying, the only thing he needs to do is do the steps, hmm. man. That proved to be completely right. God bless him. He's, he's dead now. Tell me what so, the problem so was. Tell me it was me. Tell me what the solution was. Tell me it was God. He didn't tell me to go find God. He, he showed me how to find God hmm. Look through the steps. That's that re truly is one of those, you know, miracles, hands of God in, in the life of, you know, one of us who is just a, a peon in the world. But I think that's proof that God knows who you and I are and is willing to give us opportunities. So you said he showed you who God was. He showed you how to, how to connect with God. Right. Well, let me go back to that moment. So I'm on the phone with yeah. him. He's, Get on your knees. We're going to pray. And um, I didn't pray. He prayed. I just listened. I'd like to say I got up off that and the clouds parted and I, you know, and a flock of doves flew by and everything was mm -hmm. fine. And I, it wasn't like that. I did get up off my knees and felt different. You know, I still felt crazy and I still was. Mm -hmm. I felt like there was hope. I guess that's the best way. And he came and got me, like I said, took me to a meeting and um, he started to exp explain to me what was the problem. I was suffering from untreated alcoholism. I had never heard that term. 15, mm -hmm. I'm 15 years sober now. I had never heard the term untreated alcoholism until that wow. day. Yeah. Huh. He, he kind of laid out the program of recovery. You know, he took me through steps. It, it, this is a funny thing. Um, to understand for you probably understand it. Alcoholics, right. anybody that's been through the steps understands it. If you haven't been through the steps, if you're not an alcoholic, um, most people get into AA today. I'm talking about in the last, the last 20 years, okay. most people are sober when they enter AA. 
Very seldom do you see somebody come in drunk, come repeatedly drunk, and then get sober in AA. Then that's not the majority experience. Most people, my first day in AA, I was sober. 99% of the people I've seen come into AA are already sober. We've already taken step one. We realize alcohol is the problem. You know, so the first two steps, they're steps of coming to. Yeah, you're not really taking them. If you look at the big book, the big book, the steps become italicized at step three. Mm -hmm. Awareness steps, right? That's what they are. You have mm -hmm. to understand that you have a, a, a problem that you're not going to, that you can't help, right? So you, you read the doctor's opinion. That tells us that we're restless, irritable, and discontent. Those mm -hmm. are the three underlining conditions of every alcoholic addict. And that doesn't go away when you put the plug in the jug, the crack pipe down, the needles, that doesn't go away. You remain restless, irritable, and discontent. And the only way that stops is to pick up your drug of choice or have a spiritual awakening, you know? Mm. So hence, you know, 15 years later, I'm out of, you know, it's 10, by, by year 10, I knew I was in trouble. Just before my 15th year anniversary, the, you know, the wheels come off the wagon. Mm -hmm. I am out of my mind. And he tells me, you know, read the first 64 and a half pages. He said, when you're done with that, he says, we'll do step three. And, you know, and that's what we did. You know, when you, if you read how it works, mm -hmm. and, the, you know, really have we seen a person fail? You got all that, that those first two pages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically, to me, are full of warnings, right? Completely give yourself to this simple program. Mm -hmm. You know, rigorous honesty, um, half measures, you know, will not work, right? You, you right. got to come, you got to understand all those warnings. And then you get to the, the three pertinent ideas, which are a summary of the chapters that we read. Nobody, I'm 15 years sober. Nobody ever went through this with me. Hmm. Nobody ever explained this to me. Nobody ever explained that, you know, he asked me those three pertinent questions. I was, I'm going to take, I'm going to take a formal third step, right? That's what I'm going to mm -hmm. do now. Right. Right. Which is making a decision. I'm not turning my will and my life over to God. I'm making a decision to do that. Correct. Right. So let me stop here real quick and read those three pertinent ideas that you're referring to. I'm, I'm looking on page 60 of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous right now. A is that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. And C, that God could and would if he were sought. Correct. Right. And those are the summaries of the first three chapters, you know what, that we're alcoholic and could not manage our own life, that's there is a solution, right? Right. If I could figure out how to manage my own life, I'll figure out how to drink. Mm -hmm. okay. And then you've got B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism, which is more about alcoholism, right? I think it's the first, you see the first or second sentence says, um, no person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different, right? No person likes to think he is bodily. That's the that's what we go over in the doctor's opinion. Mentally, that's what we go over in the um and there is a solution, right? When you get to more about alcoholism, it says it doesn't matter that you know you're a bodily different. It doesn't matter that you know that you're gonna drink anyway. Mm. Right? Control. That's, I think, in the second paragraph, right? Right. It's not about puking. It's not about blacking out. It's not about how many divorces, not about how many cars I cracked up, how many jobs I got fired from. Do I lose control over the amount I take when I start to use a drink? That's, that's it. It's not about being sexually abused. It's not about being beat up by my father. It's not about, I may have drank over those things, but I didn't become an alcoholic over those things. A lot of people have been sexually abused. A lot of people have been beat up. A lot of people have come home to find their mother and father's dead. Right. They didn't become alcoholics or drug addicts. Mm. I, I may have drunk over those things. And this, this is what was, a, it was never explained to me in the first, you know, 15 years. I heard a lot of drunk a lot. There's nothing wrong with that. I could identify with that. I really could. And I connected with it. You know, I understood. You know, and then you get into a, 
we agnostics, and it says, I hope we made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. That being so, you're suffering from a malady, I think it says, that only a spiritual experience will conquer, you know. So that's, those are the three pertinent ideas, right? And so my, so this guy paraphrased, I mean, he, he said, I'm going to ask you the three pertinent uh, questions. I'm going to paraphrase him. He said, if you, you know, I knew I had to answer yes to him. <laughs> he said, you, you're an alcoholic. I'm like, yeah, do you believe you need help? I'm like, yeah, are you willing to go to any length to get better? And I had to pause for a second because I, was trying to figure out what he meant. That's what alcoholics do. I'm always trying to think, well, where's he going with that question? Right. <laughs> you know, and uh, but I knew I had to say yes, so I just said yes. Hmm. And then he said, um, well, we can do step three now. And if you look right after that, mm -hmm. right, it says being convinced we are now at step three, and it becomes italicized. Right. Because we are actually taking action now. Hmm. No, I like that. And then step three reads, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. So tell me what that looked like when, when your sponsor brought you to that point and said, okay, let's take step three. Tell me what that looked like for you. Okay, well, he asked me those three pertinent questions, and he said, we're going we're gonna to do step three. We're going to do a formal step three. He says, you're going to make a covenant with God that – you will do the steps. You'll finish the steps. You won't do just step three and a, and a fourth step. You're going to finish the steps and you will take another man through the steps that that's, hmm. he called it a covenant, you know? Right. And, um, I'm like, yeah, yeah, no problem. And, um, so we actually, I was out in the church parking lot. It was after a meeting. We got down on our knees and, um, held hands and he recited the third step prayer. Yeah, I'm 15 years sober. I couldn't, I knew the third step prayer. I had heard it, but I couldn't have recited it. Mm. He said, just repeat after me. And he, you know, chopped it up into pieces. And I just repeated after him. And <laughs> so, Bill, are you okay reciting that third, that third step prayer for us right now? So the others who are listening can hear what that is. Cause it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Oh, absolutely. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self. Now, I want to stop for a second and explain what bondage is. Okay. And then he had to explain it to me. I never understood. Bound to a service with no hope for freedom. And the service I am bound to is me. Life is all about me. It's about my wants, my needs, my desires, whatever it takes to get those things. Right? I may act like I care about you, but it's only if I can get something. Even if it's an attaboy out of you, I got to get something from you, right? No, just me giving. I can dress it up. I can put a bow on it. I can pretty it all up, but it's really all about me. Mm. So, he's, so it says, relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those that I would help of thy power, thy love, thy way of life. May I do thy will always. And we said that. And I remember, I got up, I got up off the ground before he did. And I remember saying, now what do we do? <laughs> and he was still on the ground. He looked up at me and he said, we? He said, Bill, we are going to do nothing. You and God are going to do a little work. <laughs> mm. And that's, that's really what it's all about because you write a, the fourth step, a solitary self-appraisal. You write that fourth step. He, my instructions was to pray and write. Right? That's the template for my life is that third step is you pray and act. Right Before, before this, my life was get into a jackpot and try to pray my way out of it. Mm. The template today from step three on being convinced you are now at step three is I should pray then act, right? You bring God. I pray. Then I, I pray to the first step. I pray. Then I write, I pray. And then I read the fifth step, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the step six is, you know, are you now ready? I, 
prepare myself. That is the prayer for step seven, right? which is follow through for step three, right? I go all in on step seven. If I make amends, I pray, then make amends, right? I get up in the morning, I pray, and then I go into the day. Right. So that's supposed to be the template and it's worked. I, you know, I'm not perfect at anything, right. but um, I, I pretty much adhere to that. So pray and act, pray yeah. and act. Act. Yeah. Instead of act, get yourself into a mess and then please God deliver me from this mess I got myself into, huh? I'll never do it again. <laughs> Exactly. exactly. How often have we done that? <laughs> oh my God. As soon as the smoke clears, it's like, well, you know, that really wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's funny. I love how your sponsor at that point, you're kneeling in the, in the church parking lot. You say the third step prayer, you get up and you say, Hey, what are we going to do? I love your sponsor's response. We, what are you talking about? You bill and God are now going to go do it. Right, because the whole point is, is the, is those three print and ideas that no human power is going to relieve my alcoholism. Right, no doctor, no, no therapist, no psychologist, no guru, no no uh, super sponsor. Oh God, God, and that's yeah, right. He'll show me the directions, hmm. but I do the actual work with God. I I can remember the look on his face. That was seventeen years ago. For him looking at me like like I had ten heads. We, because Bill, you and God are going to do a lot of little work. I'm just giving you directions. Mm. I love that. He's just a tour guide, basically, huh? Amen. Very good. Mm. Uh, very cool. So, share with me a couple of times, one or two experiences that you've had where you say, "Hey, God, what do you need me to do today?" He directs you and you do it and you find success. Give me a shot, uh, an example of that in your life, maybe. I have never, I don't want to say never, but I don't know if I've ever had a direct God shot. I, mm. God for me has been a bank shot. It works through people, right? Mm -hmm. I had a very powerful fifth step experience. Okay. Everybody has it differently. For me, and I'm not saying it wasn't anything theatrical or biblical, you know. Um, it was just for the first time in my life, I saw the truth about who I was. Hmm. And from that day on, I was told to pray when I get up, not, not just pray, meditate when I get up in the morning. And my sponsor was, he was very, it's in my way of the highway. He was one of, this is the way he would say things to me. He was one of these rough and tough and hard to bluff, right? Sponsors. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Their suggestions when they come out of my mouth, their orders when they go in your ears, Bill, uh, you know, uh. now we're done. You're going to, you're going to pray and meditate. That's it. You, you, you agree to it. And I would call him up and um, I'd say, Hey, you got a minute, you know, I got something, I got an issue going on here. He goes, He'd say, did you uh, meditate this morning? I'm like, no. And then, say, well, there's nothing to talk about, Bill. <laughs> you, you made a covenant with God that you would do all the steps. Sounds like half measures. You know, my belief and my experience in um, 32 years of sobriety is I have yet to meet anybody that's singularly addicted. Hmm. I may have my primary drug of choice, which was alcohol. Mm -hmm. But if I couldn't get alcohol, I will find something to relieve the pain that I was in, whatever type of pain you want to call it. I'll go to pot. I'll go to pills. I'll go to uppers, downers, you know, you name it. And um, the unmanageability part of my life in 15 years spun out of control to those other addictions. Hmm. So as you look at that and you say, Hey, you know, you haven't experienced somebody with this singular addiction. There's always seems to be something to fill the void if I don't have access to what my primary Amen. addiction is. So Amen. how do you, how did you, and how do you suggest to others to fill that with something that's not also a detrimental um, addiction? I'll tell you, the thing, the one thing that separates 
me from God in sobriety is poor sex conduct. Mm. And that's what spun out of control in my life in sobriety. Mm. Now, there's no greater pleasure on earth than sex. The problem with that is it, that's supposed to be a byproduct, the pleasure. It's not supposed to be the primary purpose of, of having sex. In the, it, there is a solution. It talks about the requirement, you know, the requirement for membership may be a desire to stop drinking. That's I come in and claim my seat. But the uh, requirements for success are described in there is a solution when it says uh, almost none of us likes the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confession of our shortcomings, right? Doing the work mm-hmm. that the process requires for successful consummation. That's a very interesting word Bill uses here. And inside, yeah. in, right? Inside that word consummation is two words, one being sum, the sum total. And it's a Latin word, summa, like in magna sum laude of the highest, high order, or cum sum laude, which is of the highest order, right? Mm-hmm. Right. That's what consummation means. Now, you know, in the old days, when you got married, you consummated your marriage. Right. You became one with your partner, right? You know, you literally became one person. That's the point. And you can't do this. You can't become whole without giving God all the pieces, right? That's what we do. We, we, we have to, right, half measures availed us nothing. We completely give ourselves to this program. What brings you there is the pain yeah. that you're totally out of control. Everything's that, that's worthwhile in your life. You've tried all the, you know, um, I switched from this to that. And I don't care if you switch from hard liquor to, to wine or beer, or, and then you can switch from alcohol to pot and you can switch right. from um, that to sex or food. You know, you kill yourself with a knife on a fork. I found that there was this switching of addictions. I had my primary addiction. It's my go-to is alcohol period. Mm-hmm. But if I'm restless, irritable and get discontent, I'm going to try to get out of that feeling. And I try it with all these other substitutes that brought me to a nervous breakdown. You know, and the nervous breakdown, you know, ended up in, in an odd way being the best thing that ever happened to me because it brought me to doing to a point where I would say, yeah, I'll do the steps. I'm, I don't believe they'll work. Okay, yeah, I'll do them. Well, good. So what does um, living in step three look like to you on a daily basis? What does your routine typically look like? I get up in the morning. And, um, you know, first thing on my mind, you know, there's, there's an old saying in AA, it, it says, uh, I get up every morning with a brand new set of old ideas. Mm. You know, my ego tries to rebuild itself every day. I think I'm in charge. I think I know what's going on. So I get up every morning and I do 10 and 11, right? I do what well, 10s is just walking around. I, I start my day off with prayer and meditation. I spend 45 minutes to an hour of just quiet time. Mm. And that sets the stage for my day, step 10, right? Mm-hmm. And then at the end of the day, I review it. All right? Just a, a quick review. I use the four absolutes. Uh, those are the principles, right? Right. Those are the principles, and we practice these principles in all our affairs. It's absolute honesty, absolute purity, mm-hmm. absolute unselfishness, and absolute love. So I, I run, that's my checklist at night. Mm. Am I absolutely honest today? If I say I was, I'm lying. Right. right. I, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm an alcoholic and I'm, and I'm a human being. You know, I try to do the best I can. Right. You know, somewhere along the line, I may have sanded off the edge of a truth, you know, so it was a half truth. You know, and my sponsor, when we would did the inventory process, he would say anything that's not the truth is a lie. There's no such thing as a white lie or a, or, or a half truth. That Those are lies, Bill. <laughs> So at the end of the day, you know, I review and ask God's forgiveness and um, ask what corrective measures I should have taken and, you know, I need to take. And, you know, I get up at the end of the day and, um, I, you know, I go to bed. I can put my head down and, and, and sleep at night. I'm not, I'm not trying to juggle all the facts around to, to suit my reality. Like, well, if, they, if this had happened or if she had said that or 
he had done that and I wouldn't have had to. And I, I don't have to juggle those facts around. Me. Right. I just do a review, you know, and I get up in the morning and I pray and meditate and I just try to live by those four absolutes. Yeah. So Bill, there's going to be people that listen to this. It'll be like, and I, I guarantee you people will say, uh, Bill's 71 years old. He has time for 45 minutes to an hour every morning to meditate. He has time in the evening to do these things. I have no time for that. What response do you have to that? Um, I'll tell you what, what, what my sponsor told me. Yeah. You know, I'm saying, listen, I got to get up. I got to go get my kids. I'm divorced. I got to get my kids. I, I'm working full time. And he just say, Bill, you're going to have to set your alarm earlier. That's all. That's all. You know, because in the big book, it says we ceased fighting anything. That's what a 10-step promise, right? Mm-hmm. We ceased fighting anything or anyone. But, but by now, sanity has returned. Now, here's another thing. Being sober and being sane are completely different. Right. Right. I can be sober. I was. Mm-hmm. Right? I was out of my mind. You know, what I need is that step two, be return to sanity and sanity being, you know, I do the same thing over and over again, right? Expecting a different result, right? That, mm-hmm. right? That's the old fashioned um, definition of sanity. And, and, and that's true. Uh, so I, I have to get up. It, he'd say, well, if you're so tired, go to bed earlier. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, instead of going to bed at 10, go to bed at nine. Well, you know, well, go to bed at eight. Yeah. You get up. You're the one that said you'd go to any length. And one of the things that I've heard and I've shared with sponsees that I work with and my sponsor shared with me um, is if you are in addiction, if you are in active addiction, you're going to find time to act out in your addiction. You're going to find time to drink. You're going to find time. Why can't you find time to do these things? You know? Yes. Amen. Amen. It's another lie. I tell myself that I haven't got time. You know, I, but, you know, just to get back to the anxiety and the fear, uh, mm-hmm. I didn't realize how much fear I was in. You don't have to be a man to make believe you don't have fear. I just think as humans, we just, we pretend that there's, there's not a lot of fear in my life. That fear ended up turning into anxiety. And um, it says in the big book, driven by a hundred forms of fear, Right. Self-delusion, mm-hmm. I tell myself a lie. Self-seeking, I swing the lie into action. Self-pity, that's where it ends. Doesn't it? Self-pity, yeah. why, did I, why did I do that again? I don't know, it doesn't have to be drinking. Mm-hmm. It'd be whatever. Why, did I, why can't I control myself? When you do it in the fear, you see that the, the fear is the catalyst, right? That's the thing that springs me into action, right? Everything I do and don't do, was driven by a hundred forms of fear. I tell myself a lie to get out of the fear so I can feel better. Well, to do this, Bill, it'll make you feel better, right? Hmm. Right? I swing that into action and it doesn't make me feel better. It may temporarily, but it doesn't. Mm-hmm. It's not right. the answer. God's the answer, right? It's getting there. We're, I could be in a crack house and be closer to God if I want God. Hmm. What the hell am I doing here again? God, please help me. Right? Then being a church, gawking at women, or looking at some guy that didn't do a good job painting my house and I'm... Hmm taking his inventory, I could be further away from God in church than I could be in a crack house where I want God. Mm, Definitely. And I've experienced, you know, something similar to that, you know, in the culture that I grew up in, uh, an addiction recovery meeting of any kind would be similar to a crack house. I mean, how could you go and associate with those type of people, you know? And yet when I'm in these, in these rooms, when I'm in these groups, I am closer to God than I have ever been in any church or any place of worship uh, at any time. And I think my experience is, and I had somebody share this with me once, God bestows his, his spirit most on those who want it most and those who need it most. And if I go into a, into a room with other brothers and sisters who are, um, seeking God and just desperate for him in all our giving our lives and our will over to him. That is where God is going to be is in those places. And that's been my experience. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Oh, without a doubt. I had done the inventory process and um, I went on a nice little three year 
high on, um, you know, just working the program and being basically relieved from the bondage of self. And I started slipping back into um, poor sex conduct. I knew I was in trouble. I remember dropping to my knees and saying, God, please help me. I don't want to go back there. Mm. God, I'll do anything. Please don't take me back there. And I, I got the answer that night. I got it, man. Mm. And it wasn't a flash. The room didn't light up with a lighter. I wasn't whisked off to a, a mountain top with wind blowing through me. You know, when, just what you said, when you honestly, completely reach out and just say, God, I need your help. I can't do this. He shows up or he, she, whatever, whatever. Yeah. But it's an all, it's an all or nothing. Hmm. There's no 99%. They may get you through this week. That may get you through a month, right? It may but get it, you through 15 years, huh? <laughs> it may get you through 15 years. <laughs> Barely. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> If that's why the book says, what about the real alcohol? Now, here's the guy that's been baffling us, right? Mm-hmm. Does crazy and absurd things. He's a real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? I'm running around. I'm Mr. Hyde, and I'm trying to pretend I'm Dr. Jekyll. You know, mm. that was my life, 15 years sober, you know? Mm. And, man, it is no way to live. Yeah. So, Bill... Before we close up, what other words of wisdom do you have about step three? And then I'm going to have a a close-up question for you. Well, understand that step three is just one step in in the, you know, the absolute purity, you know, to purify yourself, right? Purify yourself of resentment, fear, poor sex conduct. Step three is just the beginning. Do I get on my knees and take a step three every morning? I don't know if I'd call it that. I get on my knees and pray every morning. I made that decision, well, it's got to be 17 years ago now. Mm-hmm. I'm not perfect, but I made that decision. I have to call get God in on everything I do. You know, if I don't, I screw it up, right? I, it, you know, I just try to have this awareness that there's something greater than me. There's a good friend of mine, he's a lawyer. He always says, Bill, when I walk into the car- courtroom, I open the door and let God in first. You know, and that's, I try to live by that, that, that type of thinking, you know, start your day off. You got to, you got to just bring God into it. That's all. You know, you go through the day, you know, pause when agitated or doubtful. Is it easy in the beginning? No, you feel like you're running blind, but after a while you practice it, practice it. And you, you all of a sudden you have that intuitive thought, Hey, geez, if I do that, I'm going to be, I'm not, this is not going to go well. Mm. You start listening to the innermost self right? Mm-hmm. Keep out the whisper within, whatever. It, it, but it takes practice. But first, you got to clear away all the baloney that's separating you from God. That's what step four is. Solitary self-appraisal. Stop five. It's not solitary. I'm admitting to, uh, to myself and to another human being. You got to do it. So step three is the beginning. Beginning. You got to get to that point where your bag of tricks is empty. There's nothing you can do, but try. It. You, don't have, you don't have to believe in it. You just got to be willing. Mm. Right. And you got to be open. Right. Say, okay. Yeah, I know it worked for you. Maybe, maybe. And um, after that, it's just practicing the presence of God, trying to practice the, you know, somebody once said that you, you find the truth, right? When you do the inventory process, that the truth with a lowercase T brings you to the truth with a capital T. Mm. That's exactly what happened to me. Mm. You know, and I can't put it, I, I call it God. Because I have no other, I know I have no better word for it than God. Hmm. Now, Bill, something came up, triggered an additional question. So I have two more questions for you. First one is earlier you referenced, and you've made reference to this several times in this conversation, that what your sponsor said is you are making a covenant with God in taking this, that you will do these things. And my understanding of what a covenant is, it's a two-way promise between a person and someone in higher power and higher authority that if the person if the person does something the person in higher authority also promises to do something in return so in this case it's between you and god so as you've covenanted with god what types of returns on that as you've tried imperfectly as you are to hold up your end of the bargain what types of returns are you seeing in your life from god I have not had an anxiety attack 
since the day I read my fifth step. Wow. And I have not had a depressive episode in my last two months. I could barely get off a couch. Oh, and you're right. You couldn't have put the definition of covenant any better. It's agreement between two people. If I do my end, and, and my end comes first, if I do my end of the agreement, God's end, which is to relieve me of the bondage of self, of the insanity of trying to live inside my head. I don't that I don't have to live like that. Mm. You know, and then then I get to carry that message, right? Yeah. The message I carry. That there, there is a solution. Mm -hmm. The solution is not meetings. If you just don't drink and go to meetings, if you make the meetings and the fellowship your solution, eventually that's gonna blow up in your face. Mm. Love that. I mean, because so often when we're carrying the message, the one of the first things we say in carrying the message is come to meetings, right? <laughs> yes. yes. But and that's not the solution. That's a, a step towards the solution, right? The meetings support the program of recovery. The, when the meetings become the program of recovery, you're, you're in trouble if you're an alcoholic. You are. Yeah. If you just puked a few too many times, a blacked out a few too many times. That's all well and good. God bless you. But if you're a real alcoholic, which the book takes pains to describe, mm -hmm. that that's only going to work for a while. Yeah. And that's all nice. And that the meetings support the program of recovery. The program of recoveries is the steps to finding God by right? finding the truth about who you are. Mm. I love that. Now, final question here, Bill. There's going to be lots of people listening to this who are on the fence or fearful about walking into a, a room, a group for the first time. What advice do you have for that person? How can What hope um, do you have for them to encourage them to take that step to come and join and then find the solution after joining with that group? I remember my first um, AA meeting. I remember... I going there and I was, I, I was so nervous. I was almost sick to my stomach and you go in and everybody, the genuineness of the people in there is, you can't describe it. You know, the people, you know, when they say, we're glad you're here, that they are glad you're there. Mm -hmm. a outpouring of love and understanding that I've never received anywhere else. You know, I didn't want anybody to talk to me, but I was glad everybody noticed me. You know mm. what I mean? You're in that place where don't come near me, but I was glad that they were hugging me. Mm. You're in this, uh, this weird paradox. Just go, just, just go, just go. And, um, the people there are going to make you feel good. Yeah. Love it, Bill. I really appreciate you taking time to, to have this conversation with me. You knocked it out of the park. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you, Justin. It was a pleasure. Well, there you have it. That's Bill. Thank you so much for listening in and hearing his step three experience and his turning his will and life over to the care of God as he understands him. Thanks again for your support of RICO 12. If you find value in these meetings and in these episodes, please consider donating and rating and reviewing in the podcast platform of your choice. And remember, there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. Keep coming back. Let's trudge this road of happy destiny together.
survive the storms and walk through wind and rain. Still standing, I will fight the good fight. Still searching for glimmers of light. See you.